Hello, we're continuing our study in the life of Saul. We're in 1 Samuel. In chapter 13, we saw the rejection of Saul's descendants from being king after him. In chapter 15, we're going to see the rejection of Saul himself from being king. It's a tragic story. We see something of the personality of God as God grieves and something of the personality of Samuel as Samuel grieves over the potential in Saul that seems to be lost. His personality type is getting more and more set. He's threatened by the people. Uh, he's paranoid by what others think. He doesn't have a sense of the sacred. He just has a, a sense of what's expedient. He tends to magnify himself in the eyes of others so that his ego can be soothed. These kinds of things are going to lead deeper and deeper into rebellion and alienation with the covenant God. Let's begin in chapter 15, verse 1. Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me. Now in the Hebrew, the word me is emphatic. And Samuel is going to give Saul a word from God. When Saul disobeys the word that Samuel gives him, in a real sense, he's disobeying God's word. That's the implication of the word me being emphasized in the Hebrew text. To anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, this occurs, uh, uh, happened earlier, chapter uh, 9, 16, chapter 10, verse 1, or allusions to this anointing. To anoint somebody meant to symbolize the special call and equipment of God. Kings were anointed, Saul. Priests were anointed, Aaron, the high priest. Sometimes prophets were anointed. The word anoint is the root of the Hebrew word Messiah, which comes into Greek as Christ. And so Jesus Christ is really the anointed one. And he really fulfills all of these three Old Testament anointed offices, prophet, priest, and king. Uh, notice if you would where it says, now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. When Samuel spoke, he spoke as the Lord. Uh, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, that we talked about it earlier in Samuel. Uh, it can mean the Babylonian astral deas. It can mean the council of heaven. It can mean uh, the captain of the army of heaven. Uh, I'm not real sure. I would think it's the captain of the army of heaven is, is my understanding of it. I will punish Amalek. For what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now what happened, if you want to go back, there's two places, I guess, that you see this most clearly. Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16, and Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19. Amalek is a, a nomadic tribe from Esau, and we see that in Genesis 36, 15 and 16. And they were in the southern Judea region, the northern area of Sinai. And they, would, they attacked the stragglers, the old people, the sick people, the ones at the very end of the column. And they were just hated for that. They became a, their name became synonymous with evil and corruption and wickedness. And so here we're going to have not a war where someone invades Israel like the Philistines, uh, but a special kind of war against this particular Arab tribal group for what they did back in the Exodus period. And notice it's going to be a real intensified war because it's going to be a holy war, and we'll see what that means in the next verse. Now go and strike Amalek, and notice your Bibles now. Mine says, utterly destroy. This is the word harem. It's related etymologically to the word harem, a group of women separated to one man. Harim means to be separated uniquely to God. Uh, sometimes it's translated under the ban. And this, of course, is an aspect of holy war. You might want to see Leviticus 27, 28, uh, and 29, and Joshua 6, 17, and 18 for how this holy war existed. Everything that breathed died, and all the possessions, the precious possessions, were either given into God's temple or burned and destroyed because they were so holy they were specially given to God. It was kind of a way of stopping the personal profit motive from war. Usually the warriors got the spoil of war, but here the spoil all went to God. Some reasons why people have thought about this holy war is number one, they say it's for theological reasons, and you might want to see Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 18. 
Some say it's the judgment on their godless lifestyle. You might want to see Deuteronomy 9, 4, and particularly maybe Genesis 15, 16 for how the Canaanites were judged. Some say it was, to make sure we understand, it was not because that Israel was good, uh, Deuteronomy 5, 9. It was quite the opposite. Israel was not a good people, but it was to glorify God, Deuteronomy uh, 9, 6. Um, I want to say, and finally, number four is that when Israel did the same kinds of things that the Canaanites and the Amalekites did, God also took them out of the land, so God is no respecter of persons. Now, be careful not to judge this uh, particular thing where the women, the children are all killed, the animals, by our day. Our day has some pretty pagan aspects too. Abortion, the way we treat the elderly, uh, polluting uh, our environment for money and knowing we're killing many people, greed. So let's don't judge them. It was not something unique to Israel. We have some uh, documented, I think it's on the uh, Moabite stone, or uh, I think that's where it is, that talks about holy war from Moab and for the god Chemosh. So it's, it, was, it was not unique to Israel. All that he has, do not spare him, but put to death both man, woman, child, and infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. If it breathed, it died. And Saul summoned the people and numbered them in, uh, now this is, I have T-E-L-I-A-M in my New American Standard. This seems to be related to the T-E-L-E-M, a town in southern Judah found in Joshua 15:24. Notice 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. My goodness, this is a lot bigger than chapter 13 where he only had 600 men. Obviously, Saul was very well equipped to rallying the tribes around him. And his victory in 13 caused the, the whole tribal uh, Infictione or tribal league to follow after him. And Saul came to the city of Amalek. Now, that's surprising because Amalek is a nomadic a desert tribe. Some have said it means the territory of Amalek or maybe the residence of the king. We're just not real sure. And they set ambush in the valley. Uh, some say this is technically should be the wadi, but we're just not sure. And Saul said to the Kenites, now who are the Kenites? Well, they're sometimes uh, either a tribal group or a part of the Midianites. Uh, Jethro, Moses' father and all, is called a Kenite and a Midianite. And some say because Jethro, also called Jether, also called Ruel, also called Hobab, uh, was so helpful to the people of God, they're going to spare his people here. And you might want to see Numbers 10, uh, 29, uh, where they're called Midianites. Now, they're going to warn these Kenites, Kenites to get away from the Amalekites, and uh, they will do that and be spared and not be killed. Lest I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel, when they came up from Egypt. And of course, this is uh, the account uh, in Exodus and Numbers. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah. You go to Shur. Now, Havilah is uncertain. We don't know where it is. The one place name we do know is in the wrong position. There's either two of them, or this is uh, something we're not sure of. Some say it's the Wadi here. Uh, go to Shur. Now, Shur is one of the wildernesses. It's right along the Mediterranean coast uh, to the direct west of the land of Goshen. Uh, and uh, the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula, way up north there, sure. And he captured Agag. Now, Agag seems to be not a personal name, but a name for the king of the Amalekites. Uh, back in Numbers, let me see if I can find it, 24-7, there was another Agag. Many think it may be like Hadad for Syria, or Pharaoh for Egypt, or Caesar for the, Ro for the Roman emperors. Others say, no, it's just a name like many times in Israel, the same name was repeated, Jeroboam the one, Jeroboam two. Maybe this was a popular name that was repeated over and over in the royal line. We're just not sure. But it's not the same one as Numbers 24, obviously. Uh, kept him alive, but utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now, Josephus, in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, which explains the Old Testament in light of the Jewish traditions of Jesus' day, says that he spared the king because the king was t so tall and looked so good. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. That's what Josephus says. And notice it says, but Saul, uh, Saul and the people spared Agag. Now, my New American Standard has, and the best of the sheep. But the literal Hebrew is the second best. Some think it just means that the firstborn sheep was offered to God. This is the, the sheep that were uh, children of the, they were born after that to the flock. 
and they would be the prime animals for both butchering and for raising. Oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless they utterly destroyed. Now, notice the personal interest here. It seems to be they picked what was best and were not willing to destroy it. Later, Saul's going to say they were going to sacrifice it, but this verse implies they did it for their own interest. They wanted part of the spoil for themselves. Everything that wasn't any good, they kind of gave to God. And boy, you could spiritualize that, couldn't you? We kind of give God the leftovers of our lives. I think there's something true about that. It was true of the people of God here, this army. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king. Now this word regret has caused commentators the misery. That God regretted shows something of his personhood. Now, it's obvious we're using human emotions to talk about God, which is inappropriate, and it's never exhaustive. It's always an analogy. Does God feel deeply that someone he called and someone he wanted to do well has chosen to go a different way? Yes, I think God does feel like that. I think God does grieve over his creation destroying itself and going away from him. Now the question comes, this anthropomorphic phrase, by the way, is used in Genesis chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, that he was sorry that he made man. Now, notice if you would over in verse 29 and 35. In 29 it says, and God does not ch lie or change his mind. He is not a man that he should change his mind. And many have said, see, this shows that uh, the Bible contradicts itself. That is not at all what we have here is a contradiction. That the word, the same word is used in two different ways. When it's used of man, it's the concept of repentance, that man has a sorrow uh, that, uh, because he's violated something of what he believes God wants him to do, and he turns from that willing to change his lifestyle. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew, the ideal of repentance is a change of lifestyle. In the Greek, it's a change of mind. Both are involved in repentance. It's the willingness to change that's precipitated by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God is certainly not convicted of sin, but he is grieved. Here's the sorrow aspect. Uh, but man has the element of sin and sorrow involved. And of course, then in verse 35, the emphasis of verse 11 is repeated that God was sorry that he had made Saul king. Sorry, why? Because he didn't know Saul would do this? No. Didn't he know that man would rebel in the Garden of Eden and, and his heart go wicked? Yes. He's sorry man chose to go that way. And that's the ideal here. And I think we need to, need to see that if we could. Now, notice it mentions, um, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. Now, of course, Samuel is the word that came to him, but it was God's word. And Samuel was distressed. Now, here's Samuel's aspect. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, this same word is used of anger. But here it's just deep emotion. He, Samuel is also sorry that Saul didn't work out. I think Samuel saw the, the, the potential in him. And it says, And Samuel cried out to the Lord all night, loud, wailing cries. Samuel was upset, and I think he interceded for Saul. But it was too late. And Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. Um, and he, he was told, Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel. Now, this is not Mount Carmel, up close to the Sea of Galilee on the Mediterranean coast. This is Carmel. That's about uh, seven to nine miles south of Hebron. Uh, and that's, what, that's the, the, the reference here. Uh, and he, behold, he has set up a monument for himself. Now, here's the problem. He didn't seem to set it up for God. Didn't seem to set it up for God's victory. It's, he set it up for himself. And that's this egotistical nature we see in Saul so often. Matter of fact, back in Genesis 17, 15 and 16, when Moses beat the Amalekites, he also set up a, a stele or a, a, a pillar. And maybe, that, maybe Saul's trying to make an allusion to that. It's interesting to me that the Septuagint uh, adds something here, and I think it's very interesting. Um, Josephus says, of course, that Samuel played for Saul's re reinstatement, and I think that's true. Here's the Septuagint at the beginning of verse 12. And behold, he was offering up a whole burnt offering to the Lord, the chief of the spoil which he brought out of Amalek. Now, this is a, an addition to the Masoretic text trying to show that Saul was going to sacrifice at least some of these to the Lord. He's going to make that excuse later, and this is trying to imply there was some truth in that. And he turned and proceeded down to Gilgal. Now that's the place where he was anointed earlier by Samuel. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the commands of the Lord. Now, what are two things is here. Either Saul is trying to be um, deceptive, playing like he kept the commands of the Lord and didn't, or he's being very sincere and thought he had. 
Uh, but the implications are that he was overcome by the people and his own tendency to want to want to be a big in their sight made him do that which he was uncomfortable with. And Samuel said, what is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and lowing of oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. They, meaning who? Uh, the soldiers. For the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now, the Septuagint says, our God, but the Masoretic text here says, your God. Now, this is going to happen in verse 21 and verse 30. Saul's going to start calling God your God instead of our God. I think there's something in the transition already occurring in this estrangement. Uh, now look at verse 17. And Samuel said, It is not true, though you were little in your own eyes, that you were made head of the tribes. Let's go back to chapter 9, verse 21. Uh, God, Look at verse 18. God told you to go and utterly destroy the sinners. This is the only time this is used for the Amalekites. And fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil? Now, that implies there was greed both in Saul and greed in the people. Maybe that was their true motive. And did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul t said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord, partial obedience, and went on the mission which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the choicest things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Now, we see in verse 24, this is one of Saul's excuses. One of them is he did do what God said. And the second thing was the people forced him not to completely do it. Listen to Samuel's very famous response here. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better to obey than to sacrifice than to heed than the fat of rams. Now, what is this talking about? Well, it's giving some ethical, moral motive aspects to ritual sacrifice. Some other classical passage about this will be Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17, Hosea 6, 6, Amos 5, 21 through 27, and Micah 6, 6 through 8. It's not a disparaging word about sacrifice. It's a positive word about the motive behind sacrifice and that ritual and performance by itself is not enough. The why of our actions are crucial with God. This same kind of truth is mentioned by Jesus, this very passage, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, and Matthew 12, verse 7. And I hope you will see that, that behind everything we do for the Lord, our motive is crucial. Then, continuing in the little poetic uh, rendition of Samuel, uh, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as the iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Oh, my. Now, rebellion here is as bad as the sin of divination. The word divination comes from the root to divide. It was used originally like, like what Joseph did, uh, dividing sticks, dividing tea leaves, dividing birds, dividing a sheep's liver, some way of knowing the will of God's. Divination is condemned both in Leviticus 19.26 and Deuteronomy 18.9 through 13. So Saul's acts were kind of were as bad as uh, idolatry, as, as witchcraft, as that kind of thing. Insubordination, that knowing the truth and not doing it, as the iniquity of idolatry. Now here the word is teraphim. That's usually translated household gods or household idols. You might want to see Genesis chapter 31 verses 19, 30, and 34 for where the teraphim are used. And uh, you can see that uh, they are related to idolatry. Now this you, he has also rejected you. This is repeated in verse 26 for emphasis. And this, of course, is the aspect that, first of all, in chapter 13, his descendants were barred from, from following him, and now Saul himself is rejected. It's a very, very serious kind of judgment that fell on Saul. And as Samuel turned to go, now look at your, look at your English Bible. I have the word Saul in my New American Standard, and that's, it's probably accurate, but it's in italics. The Masoretic text does not have the subject here. Who, it could be Samuel, that Saul grabbed Samuel or Samuel grabbed Saul. It's, you're not exactly sure. It's probably better that Saul uh, uh, seems to have uh, grabbed Samuel's robe. When a word's in italics, it means that it's supplied for an English reader, but it's not in the original text. And uh, so whenever you see those italicized words, be careful not make too much of them for they're, they're only supplied for English readers. Now, this same kind of symbolic act happens in, in other places. Uh, 
but here, as he grabbed the garment, it's this tight-fitting uh, garment close to the body, it tore. And notice what happened. Verse 28. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. This is, of course, a reference to David, although at this time uh, we don't know that yet. And here we have another symbolic act of this torn robe of tearing the kingdom. It will be used later for one of the kings of the north. And also the glory of Israel will not, uh, uh, will not lie or change his mind, which means uh, God's not going to repent of this judgment. You've turned away from God. Now God's going to turn away from you. You might want to see this same aspect in Numbers 23, 19 and Hebrews chapter, 8, verse, uh, th chapter 13, verse 8, that God does not change. That's one of the wonderful things about God. His nature is consistent. You say, yeah, but he changed his mind about this or that. Not really. He changed his mind about judgment if his people will respond by faith. But what he's saying to Saul is, you've already been judged. Your repentance is not going to affect the, the consequences of your sin. And really, as we're going to see in just a minute, Saul's not worried about the consequences, I mean, about, the, about losing the kingdom so much. He's worried about losing face in the sight of the people. Now watch this. And he said, I have sinned. But please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. Go back with me that I may worship uh, the Lord your God. Saul was afraid of the public opinion of the people. He was afraid of the army. That's been his problem. The man's paranoid. It's going to become worse and worse. We, we've seen the inkling of it all the way through. It's going to get progressively worse as the people praise David for his military exploits. Notice it says, so Samuel went back for, uh, Samuel went back following Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord, which I still think shows he had a, that he loved God. I don't think he's a lost person. He just didn't. He's kind of like Esau. He just had his mind on other things. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him. Now, my new American standard has cheerfully, and to some interpret this meaning, he thought that he was not going to die. Uh, this is, again, that 26 translations of the Bible that I like so much. And I want to give you some of the different or a possible wording of this word cheerfully. Some take it to mean cheerfully from the root for the Garden of Eden. Others take it to mean um, in bonds, in chains. And they get that from the parallelism of Job 38, 31. And some say from the Septuagint and the Vulgate, it means trembling. Listen to all these. Nobody knows. Cheerfully, daintily, reluctantly, trembling, with tottering steps, shaking with fear, in fetters, uh, gross of body and trembling with fear. So obviously, we don't know what this Hebrew word means. I think trembling is probably the best root, or in bonds. Uh, it says, surely the bitterness of death is past. Well, that's one translation, but another possibility is he was thinking death would have been better than this, knowing that Samuel was going to hack him to pieces. And uh, so Samuel said, as your sword has made women and children at... Uh, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord. Well, this is kind of Samuel's way of doing two things, an eye for an eye because of his, his text. This may be of his way of confirming why there was a holy war ban put on these people because they had killed women and children. The other thing is hewed is a very rare Hebrew word. I think it's only used here. It seems to mean to ritually cut up something, kind of like what Elijah does to the oxen on Mount Carmel. So he's going to ritually hack Agag to pieces. Yuck! <laughs> now Josephus says that he had someone hack him up, but the Hebrew seems to imply that uh, he did it himself. So Samuel went to Ramah, but Saul went up to his house at Gibeah. So Samuel never sees Saul again. I think he continued to grieve for him, but he never saw him again, never added his uh, presence to Saul's dignity. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. Um, for Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made him king over Israel. And here we have this uh, closing, uh, tragic aspect of the kingship of Saul. We're going to be transitioning now into the um, growing um, preeminence of David. Saul's going to do one more really stupid thing later on by going to the witch of Endor. We can see that progressively Saul is becoming a less religious man and a more paranoid, schizophrenic kind of man. And maybe this is going to be the aspect of the evil spirit of the Lord coming upon Saul after the Holy Spirit of the Lord left. But we'll discuss that in a later chapter. Um, I think it's interesting here that we can see that uh, 
To know to what's right and not to do it completely is, is a terrible sin. And then to make excuses for it, that God does want our obedience. Jesus put it so well in Luke 6, 46 when he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I tell you to do? What God wants us to do is, is the, the, the prayer known as the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. It means to hear so as to do. Or you can put it in James chapter 2. Do not be hearers only of the word, but be doers. Now what Saul is, he heard the word clearly from Samuel, but he chose for whatever reason not to do it. I would say to you that salvation is absolutely free in Jesus Christ. But once we come to know God, know the grace of God, we're responsible to obey it. Salvation is free, but it costs everything we are and have. Christian maturity is a lifestyle obedience, and that's the problem with the American church. She wants to go to heaven when she dies. She just doesn't want to live for the Lord now. We see that in the life of Saul, wanting to do his own thing. I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you and be with you.